biological information, not junk after all. We've been talking about the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, um, edited by several people that most of you know, and uh, Bruce Gordon, who most of you won't know, uh, who, is, um, who edited the section on um, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, published by World Scientific Publishing in 2013 after Springer had turned it down, probably technically illegally, but um, without much choice for the people involved to fight it. Um, the book is actually the Proceedings of a Symposium held on the th May 31 through June 3, 2011 at Cornell University and updated slightly since, as we will see, there's a specific part that's been updated for this chapter. And uh, the entire book can be found there um, at that ad address, although given that the World Scientific Publishing has um, really done, the, I think, the scientific uh, world a favor, um, I went ahead and bought a copy myself, although it costs well upwards of $100. The book cover looks like that. The book uh, is divided into a general introduction in four parts. Uh, information theory and biology, which is the one we just finished last week. Biological information and genetic theory, which is the one we're going into this week. We're doing the first chapter in that section. Theoretical molecular biology and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory, which is the one that's edited by Bruce Gordon. And the chapter we're looking at is called Not Junk After All. Non-protein coding DNA carries extensive biological information. And it's written by Jonathan Wells of the Discovery Institute. Most of you may have heard uh, of the name, at least. The abstract is um, a good direction for the whole paper. In the 1950s, Francis Crick formulated the central dogma of molecular biology, which states, in effect, that DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us. By 1970, however, biologists knew that the vast majority of our genome does not encode proteins and the non-protein coding fraction became known as junk DNA. Yet data from recent genome projects shows that most nuclear DNA is transcribed into RNAs, many of which perform important functions in cells and tissues. Like protein coding DNA, non-protein coding regions carry multiple overlapping codes that profoundly affect gene expression and other cellular processes. Next week we'll look at some of those overlapping codes. Although there are still many gaps in our understanding, new functions of non-protein coding DNA are being reported every month. Clearly, the notion of junk DNA is obsolete, and the amount of biological information in the genome far exceeds the information in protein coding regions. Although there are those who would dispute that, and we'll discuss that in a couple of weeks. Introduction. James Watson and Francis Crick's 1953 discovery that DNA consists of two complementary strands suggested a possible copying mechanism for Mendel's genes, and it's now been pretty much confirmed that that is the mechanism. In 1958, Crick argued that the main function of the genetic material is to control the synthesis of proteins. According to the sequence hypothesis, Crick wrote that the specificity of a segment of DNA is expressed solely by the sequence of bases, and this sequence is a simple code for the amino acid sequence of a particular protein. And certainly part of the DNA does function in that way. Crick further proposed that DNA controls protein synthesis through the intermediary of RNA, and most people accept that too now, uh, arguing that the transfer of information from the nucleic acid to nucleic acid or from nucleic acid to protein may be possible but transfer from protein to protein or from protein to nucleic acid is impossible. <laughs> Certainly of the detailed sequence type, that statement is still true. Which means that protein first origins for the origin of life really won't fly very well. 
Under some circumstances, RNA might transfer sequence information to DNA, but the order of causation is normally DNA makes RNA makes protein. Crick called this the central dogma of molecular biology, and it is sometimes stated more generally as DNA makes RNA makes protein makes us. The sequence hypothesis and the central dogma implied that only protein coding DNA matters to the organism. Yet, by 1970, biologists already knew that much, much of our DNA does not code for proteins. In fact, less than 2% of human DNA is protein coding. Although some people might suggest that non-protein coding DNA might help to regulate gene expression, in fact, that's probably true. Most people would say that 3% is actually involved in making proteins because you have to have a place for the, uh, uh, for the enzyme to lock on in order to uh, translate the, coating, uh, the protein coding area. So it's known that non-protein coding DNA actually has some function, but it, that would only increase it to about 3%. Um, the dominant view was that non-protein or I should say most non-protein coding regions had no function. In 1972, biologist Susuna Omo, Ono published an article wondering why there is so much junk DNA in our genome. Uh, of, of interest, uh, Ono put the actual useful DNA at about 10%, which of course includes that 3% we were talking about and then at about 7% else. So, um, um, even the, uh, most of the, uh, well, outside of Dawkins, who said that 95% was a junk, um, most people would say 90% would be a better estimate for the simple reason that you have to have things like centrosomes and telomeres and, you know, the ends of a chromosome, the middle of a chromosome and so forth. And when you start adding all that stuff up, it comes out to closer to 10% than 3%. In 1976, Oxford biologist Richard Dawkins wrote, the amount of DNA in organisms is more than is strictly necessary for building them. A large fraction of the DNA is never translated into protein. From the point of view of the individual organism, this seems paradoxical. If the purpose of DNA is to supervise the building of bodies, it is surprising to find a large quantity of DNA which does no such thing. Biologists are racking their brains trying to think of what useful tax task this apparently surplus DNA is doing. But from the point of view of the selfish genes themselves, there is no paradox. The true purpose of DNA is to survive, no more and no less. The simplest way to explain the surplus DNA is to suppose that it is a parasite, or at best a harmless but useless passenger hitching a ride in the survival ma machines created by the other DNA. Now, I want you to notice that this is a philosophical argument. This is not based on experiment whatsoever. And it's an argument that says that a large portion of DNA, Dawkins would say 95%, Ono would say 90%, is in fact junk that doesn't really help in producing our bodies. And notice that Dawkins expresses surprise on a design perspective that the adjunct DNA should be there. This is an argument that doesn't prove anything, but it does kind of uh, lay evidence one way or the other. If one assumes that only protein coding regions of DNA matter to the organism and non-protein coding DNA is just parasitic junk, it makes sense also to assume that only protein coding regions would be transcribed into RNA, right? Why would an organism engaged in a struggle for survival waste precious internal resources on transcribing junk? Yet it turns out that organisms do transcribe most of their DNA into RNA. And there's growing evidence that much, perhaps even most of this RNA, performs essential functions in cells and tissues. Now, if you omit that last part after the dash, you will notice that uh, it turns out that organisms do transcribe most of their DNA into RNA now the DNA is turning out to be not just um, junk, but wasteful, because you have to actually do something with it. So either it's a design feature, in which case there's 
actual uses for that DNA, or it's wasteful, in which case, um, why would a creator create something like that? Widespread transcription into RNAs that are probably functional. Even before the Human Genome Project was completed in 2003, there had been reports of the widespread transcription of non-protein coding DNA. In 2002, the Japanese Phantom Consortium, Consortium for Functional Annotation of the Mammalian Genome identified 11,665 non-protein coding RNAs in mice and concluded that non-coding RNA is a major component of the transcriptome. So they knew it was being transcribed. The question is, what function did it have? Other scientists reported that transcription of two human chromosomes resulted in 10 times more RNA than could be attributed to, coating, to protein coding exons. So we knew that they were being made, both in terms of selected studies and in, and in terms of kind of scattershot studies. But now with the ENCODE that has come out, in 2003, the ENCODE project for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements set out to identify all the functional elements in the human genome. It soon became obvious that most of the mammalian genome is transcribed into RNA. Preliminary data provided convincing evidence that the genome is pervasively transcribed such that the majority of its basis can be found in primary transcripts, including non-protein coding transcripts. The ENCODE project and Phantom Consortium showed that RNAs are transcribed from both strands of DNA and that antisense RNA is a major component of the mammalian transcriptome. Not only is some RNA transcribed from the antisense strand, but RNAs can be trans also transcribed from several different start sites within an open reading frame. So a single open reading frame can carry multiple overlapping codes that specify both protein coding RNAs and non-protein coding RNAs. Widespread transcription suggests probable function. Now notice that this is a design assumption. That if it's transcribed, it must be functional. The other assumption, of course, would be, well, the body just doesn't know what to transcribe. So does sequence conservation. And what we mean by that will become evident very shortly. Um, in 2004 and 2005, several groups of scientists identified non-coding regions of DNA that were completely identical in humans and mice. They called these ultra-conserved regions and noted that they were clustered around genes involved in early development. Now these are non-coding DNA they have the same structure, and if you try to imagine that if they weren't functional and mice and humans had a ancestor that gave both of them the same code, there should be random mutations along them that made them significantly different. If the millions of years that are normally assumed to be true are true, the fact that they're completely identical suggests that one of two things is true. Either they were both designed recently and haven't had a chance to diverge, that would be the creationist hypothesis, or the evolutionary hypothesis would be that they must have to be in that exact order, otherwise whenever there's a mutation of them, the uh, sperm or the egg dies before it ever joins or the new organism dies or something happens to where that organism is completely eliminated so that you only get perfect copies of them in both humans and in mice and that's why they've remained the same for um, close to 100 million years. That's the evolutionary so it has to have a function. It just has to, and it has to be a function that's, that's sequence-specific. The researchers concluded that the long non-coding UCRs act as regulators of developmentally important genes. They have to have some function, so that's their best guess as a function. That doesn't mean they know that. That means that it, 
must act. In 2006, a team studying endothelial cells which line the inside of the human blood vessels reported that conserved non-coding sequences, some without intr within introns, were enriched in sequences that may play a key role in the regulation of endothelial gene expression. So there's, there's areas in endothelial cells, especially in the introns, which are supposed to be able to change without any problem, but they, obviously they don't. Um, and so there must be some reason for them to be there. Otherwise, they would have changed over millions of years. Oxford geneticists comparing large non-protein coding RNAs in humans, rats, and mice reported conserved sequences that possess the imprint of purifying selection, therefore indicating their functionality. And in 2009, a team of American scientists found over a thousand highly conserved non-coding RNAs in mammals that are implicated in diverse biological processes. So they're finding more and more of these things that must have some function by the standard evolutionary theory. Direct evidence for some specific functions of non-coding, of non-protein coding RNAs. Now notice we've looked at indirect evidence. Now we're gonna look at direct evidence. There is also direct evidence for specific functions of non-coding uh, non protein coding RNAs. Paraspeckles are domains inside the nuclei of mammalian cells that play a role in gene expression by retaining certain RNAs within the nucleus. Several non protein coding RNAs are known to be essential constituents of them, binding to specific proteins to form ri ribonuclear proteins that stabilize the paraspeckles. Non protein coding RNAs are also involved in alternate splicing. When a eukaryotic gene is transcribed into RNA, its non-protein coding introns are removed and the protein coding exons are then spliced together before being translated into protein. In the great majority of cases, 80 to 95 percent, the exons can be alternatively spliced, which means that the resulting transcripts can lack some exons or contain duplicates of others. Alternative splicing plays an essential role in the differentiation of cells and tissues at the proper times during embryo development, and many alternatively spliced RNAs occur in a development stage and tissue-specific manner. So splicing is, is one way of producing a whole bunch of different proteins from the same uh, DNA. Although introns do not code for proteins, the RNAs transcribed from them contain specific codes that regulate alternative splicing. The mammalian thyroid hormone receptor genes produce two variant proteins with opposite effects. Just splice them a little differently. The, alter the alternative splicing of those variants is regulated by an intron. So introns are not just throwaway stuff. They actually have a function. An intronic element plays a critical role in the alternative splicing of tissue-specific RNA in mice and regulatory elements and introns control the alternative splicings of growth factor receptors in mammalian cells. In 2007, an Italian biologist reported that intronic sequences regulate the alternative splicings of a gene involved in human blood clotting. In 2010, a team of Canadian and British scientists studying splicing codes in mouse embryonic and adult tissues, including the central nervous system, muscles, and the digestive system, found that introns are rich in splicing factor recognition sites. It had been previously assumed that most such sites are close, close to the affected exons. That is to say, if you have an intron, most of the sites would be right in the parts of the intron that are next to the actual protein coding stuff. But <clears throat> leaving long stretches of DNA not involved in the process of alternative splicing, but the team concluded that their results suggested regulatory elements that are deeper into introns than previously appreciated. So the whole intron is useful, not just, uh, not just the, the ends of it. Introns encode other functional RNAs as well. Short non-protein coding RNAs are known to regulate gene expression. One of these is involved in regulating cholesterol levels in humans. Introns also encode Many of the small RNAs essential for the processing of ribosomal RNAs as well as the regulatory elements associated with such RNA coding sequences. 
Chromatin organization profoundly affects gene expression. Non-protein coding RNAs are essential for chromatin organization, and non-protein coding RNAs have been shown to affect gene expression by modifying chromatin structure. A recent study of chromatin-associated RNAs in some human cells revealed that almost two-thirds of them are derived from introns. So introns turn out to be important. You can't just ignore them. Pseudogenes are transcribed into non-protein protein coding RNAs, uh, one of the things that has been claimed to be pure junk, that in some cases regulate the expression of the corresponding protein coding genes. For example, pseudogenes can reduce gene expression through RNA interference. Since RNA transcribed from the antisense strand of a pseudogene is complementary to the RNA transcribed from the gene, the former binds to the latter and makes double-stranded RNA that is not translated. Pseudogenes can also increase gene expression through target mimicry. Since the non-protein coding RNA transcribed from the sense strand of a pseudogene resembles in many respects the protein coding RNA transcribed from the gene, the former is common to have pseudogenes of other genes, not just pseudogenes that don't, uh, uh, that don't have any actual gene resembling them. <clears throat> so the former can provide an alternative target for RNA degrading enzymes that would normally reduce the expression of a gene by inactivating its messenger RNA. So presumably the real gene slips through the cracks while the uh, enzyme is busy degrading the pseudogene RNA. About half of the human genome consists of non-protein coding rep repetitive DNA, and about two-thirds of this is made up of long interspersed nuclear elements and short interspersed nuclear elements, known as lines and signs, respectively. In mammals, the most common line has been designated L1, and in humans, the most common signs are ALUs, so named because they are recognized by an enzyme from the bacterium Arthrobacter luteus which raises a very interesting question. Why is Arthrobacter luteus interested in human uh, DNA? Human L1 sequences function by mobilizing various RNAs in the cell. L1s also silence a gene that is expressed in the liver <coughs> in human fetuses, but not in adults. So they may have some function after all. Uh, lines also participate in the necessary inactivation of most protein coding regions of the second X chromosomes in female eutherian animals. Eutherian meaning true beast, literally, and it means uh, placental animals, not uh, 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 marsupials. I'm sorry. In 2009, Colorado researchers concluded finding that these signs encoded RNAs indeed have <coughs> encoded RNAs indeed have biological functions has refuted the historical notion that signs are merely junk DNA. Now, does that mean that um, they don't have a deleterious function? No, it, it actually doesn't. It just means that they were designed to, to do some functions and apparently do them in modern uh, animals, particularly humans, well. Functions of non-protein coding DNA that are not determined by precise nucleotide sequences. The genome functions hierarchically in the order of nucleotides in protein encoding and non-protein coding DNA constitutes only the first level of that hierarchy. The length of the DNA sequences even non-protein coding ones, is a second level. Chromatin organization is a third level, and the position of chromosomes within the nucleus is the fourth. There's evidence that DNA functions at the second, third, and fourth levels in ways that are independent of the precise nucleotide sequence. For one, the length of N DNA sequence. In 1986, British biologist David Gubb suggested that the time needed to transcribe eukaryotic genes is a factor in regulating the quality of quantity of protein they produce. He proposed that the sheer length of introns in some genes would affect both the spatial and temporal pattern of expression of their gene products. In 1992, American biologist Carl Thummel 
likewise argued that the physical arrangements and length of transcription units can play an important role in controlling their time and ex uh, of ex timing of expression. For example, the very long introns in certain key developmental genes could delay their transcription, consistent with the observation that they function la later in development than genes with shorter introns. So basically, uh, if you want to put it that way, size matters. Um, something that's fine but too small doesn't work as well as something that's long enough. And we'll see why in another slide or two. In 2008, Harvard systems biologists Ian Swineburn and Pamela Silver summarized circumstantial evidence that intron length has significant effects on the timing of transcription. Development of the regulate, regulated gene networks, they wrote, where timing and dynamic patterns of expression are critical may be particularly sensitive to intron delays. So introns might have a function in the gene regulation that is independent of their exact nucleotide sequence, namely regulating the timing of transcription simply by their length. The long stretches of non-protein coding DNA between protein coding regions might also affect gene expression by their length. In 1997, molecular biologist Emily Zuckercandle, um, he wrote, along non-coding sequences, nucleotides tend to fill functions collectively rather than individually. Sequences that are non-functional at the level of individual nucleotides may function at higher levels involved in phys involving physical interactions. Because the distance between enhancers and promoters is a factor in gene re regulation, Zucker Candle wrote in 2002, genomic distance per se, and therefore the mass of intervening nucleotides, can have functional effects. He concluded, given the scale dependence of nucleotide function, large amounts of junk DNA, contrary to common belief, may, must be assumed to contribute to the complexity of gene interaction systems and of organisms. In 2007, Zucker Candle with uh, Giacomo Cavalli, Cavalli wrote that signs and lines which have been considered junk DNA are among the repeat sequences that would appear liable to have teleregulatory effects on the function of a nearby promoter through changes in their number and distribution. Since enhancers can be tens of thousands of nucleotides away from the genes they regulate, bringing together enhancers and promoters that are on the same chromosome requires chromosome looping. The size of a chromosome loop depends on the length of DNA. For physical reasons, a loop consisting only of uh, DNA must be at least 500 nucleotides long, while a loop consisting of chromatin, because of its greater stiffness, must be at least 10,000 nucleotides long. In such cases, it may be the sheer length of DNA that matters and not whether it encodes RNA. That is to say, in order to get it to bend around, you have to have somewhere between 500 and 10,000 nucleotides. And if it's too short, it won't work. And it doesn't really matter what those intervening nucleotides are, except that they better not code for something else that uh, um, will interfere with, uh, with the looping function. Because DNA is packaged into chromatin and because RNA polymerase must have access to the DNA to transcribe it, the structure of chromatin is all important in gene regulation. In many cases, various proteins in RNA mediate the attachment of RNA polymerase to the DNA by interacting with specific sequences of nucleotides. But in some cases, a mere change in the three-dimensional conformation of chromatin can activate transcription by exposing the DNA to RNA polymerase. In 2007, scientists in Massachusetts pr produced a genome-scale, high-resolution, three-dimensional map of DNA and found similar conformations that were independent of the underlying nucleotide sequence. They concluded that a considerably different DNA sequence can share a common structure due to similar chromatin conformation and that some transcription factors may be conformation-specific rather than DNA-specific sequence specific. Two years later, scientists reported that functional non-protein coding regions of the human genome 
are correlated with chromatin-related local DNA topography that can be independent of the underlying sequence. Although similar sequences often adopt similar structures, they wrote, divergent nucleotide sequences can have similar local structures, suggesting that they may perform similar biological functions. The authors of the report concluded that some of the functional information in the non-coding portion of the DNA of the genome, I'm sorry, is conferred by DNA structure as well as by the nucleotide sequence. The clearest example of a chromatin level function that can be independent of the exact DNA sequence is the centromere, a special region on a eukaryotic chromosome that serves as the chromosome's point of attachment to other structures in the cell. For example, before a eukaryotic cell divides, it makes a duplicate of each chromosome, and the duplicate copies of each chromosome are joined together at their centromeres until they separate and move to daughter cells. And they're pulled apart by something close to, if not this, that same centromere. So centromeres can form only on a foundation provided by the chromosome. Yet centromeres are built upon long stretches of repetitive DNA that some biologists have regarded as junk. Obviously not junk. That's one of the reasons why Ono has 10% and Dawkins has 5% because Ono realizes that those are part of the structures that have to be there. <coughs> Although much of the DNA that underlies centromeres is now known to be transcribed into RNA that perform a variety of functions, it turns out that centromere formation is to a great extent independent of the exact nucleotide sequence. The DNA sequences of centromere regions vary significantly from species to species, though all centromeres function similarly. If the chromosome region containing a centromere is artificially deleted and replaced by synthetic repetitive DNA, a functional centromere can form again at the same site. So, extra centromeres, called neocentromeres, can also form abnormally elsewhere on a chromosome that already has one, or on a chromosome fragment that has separated from the part bearing a centromere which is one way you can get um, multiple chromosomes out of a few of them. It seems that the centromeres can form in, at many different places on a chromosome regardless of the underlying DNA sequence. Nevertheless, the underlying chromatin must have a certain characteristic, certain, ha must have certain characteristics uh, which means, by the way, that um, not just any old DNA will do for a centromere, even though there's a wide latitude in what the DNA can have. It's not just anything goes. For example, there's evidence that some aspects of the DNA sequence are conserved. In humans and other primates, centromere's activity is normally associated with repeated blocks of 171 nucleotide subunits termed alpha satellite DNA. And this is his parenthesis. Researchers in the 1960s have discovered that a fraction of DNA consisting of millions of short repeated nucleotide sequences, presumably 171 is considered short, uh, produced satellite bands when DNA was centrifuged to separate it into fractions with different densities. So this is a term that was inherited from the bad old days when uh, we didn't have as many tools as we have now to study DNA. Every normal human centromere is located on alpha satellite DNA. Human neocentromeres form on parts of a chromosome that do not consist of an alpha um, that do not consist of alpha satellite DNA, though the neocentromere DNA still has special characteristics most notably an unusually high proportion of lines, which is interesting. These non-protein coding segments apparently play a role in localizing proteins that are required for the formation of the centromere and the kinetochore. In the 1980s, biologists identified several proteins associated with centromeres called, and called them CENPs for centromere proteins. Um, Subsequently, research revealed that one of these, CNPA, 
takes the place of some of the histones in chromatin. The incorporation of SynPA makes chromosin, chromatin stiffer and provides a foundation for assembling the other components of centromeres. In fact, centromeres in all organisms are associated with SynPA, which must be present for a centromere to form, although SynPA by itself is not sufficient. There's a whole protein complex that gloms onto this particular stretch of DNA, which, although it's variable, has to have certain characteristics to it. The modification of chromatin by SynPA and other centromere-associated proteins can be passed down from generation to generation. Indeed, the location of a centromere on a particular chromosome can persist for thousands of generations. From the perspective of the central dogma and sequence hypothesis, that is, the view that DNA sequence determines the essential features of organism by encoding proteins, centromeres are an enigma because they show that a cell can impose an essential inheritable structure on its DNA that is independent of the precise nucleotide sequence. Chromosome arrangements in the nucleus. Between cell divisions, chromosomes are not, norm are not randomly distributed in the nucleus. Instead, they dis occupy distinct domains. Chromosome domains affect gene regulation in part by bringing together specific regions of chromosomes and facilitating interactions among them. Different cells and tissue types in the same animal can have different three-dimensional patterns of chromosomes in their nuclei, and we're going to see an example, which account for at least some differences in gene expression. One notable feature of nuclear domains is their radial arrangement. Their distance from the center of the nucleus to the periphery of the nucleus where the nuclear membrane is. In 1998, biologists in New York reported that chromatin localized to the periphery of the nucleus in yeast cells tended to be transcriptionally silent. In 2001, British biologists wrote that most gene-rich chromosomes concentrate at the center of the nucleus, where the more gene-poor chromosomes are located toward the nuclear per periphery. In 2008, Dutch biologists reported that the human chromosome domains associated with the periphery of the nucleus represent a repressive chromatin environment. The same year, several teams of researchers reported independently that they could suppress the expression of specific genes by relocating them to the nuclear periphery. So it looks like in most cells uh, that have nuclei, the most translated portions are going to be in the center, and the least translated portions are going to be towards the outside of the nucleus. These data are consistent with the observation that in most nuclei, the gene-rich euchromatin is concentrated near the center, while the gene-poor heterochromatin is situated more peripherally. An important exception to this radial arrangement, however, occurs in the retinas of nocturnal mammals. The retina of a vertebrate eye consists of several different kinds of light-sensing cells. Cone cells detect colors and function best in bright light. Rod cells are more numerous and more sensitive to low light. Nocturnal animals, such as mice, need to see under conditions of almost no light, so they need exceptionally sensitive rod cells. In 1979, medical researchers examined mouse retinas with an electron microscope and found that the heterochromaton in cone cells was located near the periphery of the nucleus, like you'd expect, as in most other eukaryotic cells. But the heterochromaton in rod cells was concentrated in one large central clump which is interesting. It's the inverse of everything else. Another team of medical researchers used mice to study the genetic mutation responsible for a, an inherited human disease that caused nerve degeneration. The team found that the mutation caused blindness in mice by altering the arrangement of the chromosin in rod cells. Instead of containing a single large clump of heterochromatin surrounded by a spare rim of euchromatin, the rod cells in mutant mice showed a dramatic chromatin decondensation and resembled cone nuclei. Clearly, the unique localization of heterochromatin in the center of rod cells in mouse retinas is essential for normal vision in, th in these animals. In 2009, European scientists called the unusual pattern of centrally located heterochromatin inverted and they reported finding an inverted pattern in the rod cell nuclei of various other mammals that are primarily nocturnal. 
mice, of course, cats, rats, foxes, opossums, rabbits, and several species of bats, which is interesting because bats don't see that well, if you remember. They usually use echolocation for most of their uh, <coughs> location. But not of mammals that are primarily active in daylight, such as cows, pigs, donkeys, horses, squirrels, and chipmunks. These scientists observed that the centrally located heterochromatin had a high refractive index, a characteristic of optical lenses, and by using a two-dimensional computer simulation, they showed that a main consequence of the inverted pattern was to focus light on the light-sensitive regions of rod cells. So that at least one of the effects, it's not clear it's the only one, but one of the effects of rearranging the chromatin in this manner is to have light come through and focus in on the rod cells more effectively. In 2010, molecular biologists in France reported that the organization of the central heterochromatin in the rod nuclei of nocturnal mammals is consistent with a liquid crystal model, and British biophysicists improved upon the 2009 study by using a new computer simulation to show that the focusing of light by inverted nuclei in three dimensions is at least three times as strong as it is in two dimensions. So evidence for the functionality of non-protein coding DNA comes from several sources. Pervasive transcription of the genome, including transcription from antisense DNA in multiple start sites within open reading frames, conservation of a substantial fraction of non-protein coding sequences, particular sequence dependent functions of RNA transcribed from introns, pseudogenes, repetitive DNA, much of which is not conserved but is species specific, and functions that are to a large extent independent of the exact nucleotide sequence such as the influence of intron length on transcription timing, the role of chromatin to topography in gene expression and centromere placement, and the light focusing pro property of heterochromatin in inverted nuclei. Clearly, clearly, it is not reasonable to maintain that the vast majority of our DNA is junk. Conclusion. Multiple levels of biological information. The concept of information is applied to a linear sequence such as letters in an English sentence or nucleotides in a DNA molecule has been extensively analyzed Although protein coding DNA constitutes less than 2% of the human genome, the amount of such information in such DNA is enormous. Re recent discovery of multiple overlapping functions in non-protein coding DNA shows that the biological information in the genome far exceeds that in the protein coding regions alone. Yet biological information is not limited to the genome. Even at the level of gene expression, transcription and translation, the cell must Ha access information that is not encoded in DNA. Many different RNAs can be generated from a single piece of DNA by alternative splicing, and although some splicing codes occurred in intronic DNA, there is no empirical justification for assuming that all of the information for tissue and developmental stage specific alternative splicing resides in DNA. Furthermore, even after RNA has specified the amino acid sequence of a protein, Additional information is needed. Protein function depends on three-dimensional shape, and the same sequence of amino acid can be folded differently to produce proteins with different three-dimensional shapes. Conversely, proteins with different amino acid sequences can be folded to produce similar shapes and functions. Many scientists have pointed out that the relationship between the genome and the organism, the genotype phenotype mapping, cannot be reduced to a genetic program encoded in DNA sequences. Atlan and Koppel wrote in 1990 that advances in artificial intelligence showed that its cellular operations are not controlled by a linear sequence of instructions in DNA, but by a distributed multilayer network. According to Denton and his co-workers, protein folding appears to involve formal causes that transcend material mechanisms. And according to Sternberg, this is even more evident at higher <coughs> levels of genome of the genotype phenotype mapping. So non-protein coding regions of DNA that some previously regarded as junk turn out to encode biological information that greatly increases the known information carrying capacity of DNA. At the same time, DNA as a whole turns out to encode only part of the biological information needed for life. 
Now, due to a delay in the publication of these proceedings, the material in this chapter is now 2013, over two years old, yet it is still accurate. Indeed, the, the fact that most non-protein coding DNA serves biological functions, which is dramatically confirmed in September 2012 by 37 papers published by the ENCODE project in Nature, Genome Research, Genome Biology, the Gen Journal of Biological Chemistry, and Science. Covered the waterfront there. The project concluded that 80% of the genome is linked to biological functions, but project coordinator Ewan Burney points out that this conclusion was based on analysis of only 147 cell types, and quote, the human body has a few thousand, end quote. As more cell types are studied, Bernie said, it is likely that 80% will go to 100%. A commentary accompanying the papers in Nature described the ENCODE results as dispatching the widely held view that the human genome is mostly junk DNA. A commentary published at the same time in Science announced ENCODE project writes eulogy for junk DNA. Now, he worked with uh, Richard Sternberg in order to produce this paper. The paper, uh, my, my opinion on this is the paper is rich in data and it's difficult to shorten the paper without cutting out meaningful parts. The paper makes a good case that only a small minority of DNA is truly junk. The paper has backing, particularly from the ENCODE data, and especially the ENCODE data that's come out since he wrote it, and to a lesser extent from the phantom data. The one thing that I feel is missing is a specific takedown of ENCODE critics which have reared their head after the publishing of the ENCODE data. One could complain that in some cases sheer DNA length is the only requirement, leaving the possibility that any old <coughs> DNA would work. That's not quite true. There are certain DNA sequences that have to be avoided in this just simply filling out the length DNA. And the length can be viewed as designed regardless of the content. So I think that e even at that, <coughs> the, there is some argument that the DNA looks more designed than not. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comments, questions? Uh, we've got one in the back there. And they would have us believe that all of this came out of that scummy pond, this well, complexity? Well, so, some would. Obviously, Jonathan Wells would not. Is, uh, are we safe in assuming that 80% figure is okay? The well, that's, the uh, that's the question we'll try to answer in a couple of weeks. The ENCODE. Because there are those who argue strenuously that that 80% is not, uh, is an overestimate, be, and we'll find out exactly why they're arguing that, other than the theological reason that there must not be a designer and therefore uh, it shouldn't look designed. Back when I took biology, uh, way back, um, they spoke about the simple cell because, you know, they just didn't know, you know, more about it. Could this really be applied to this junk DNA? Well, I, I think the simple cell, yeah, and, and, and there are people who took that literally. Mm -hmm. Ernst Haeckel found some nondescript ooze at the bottom of the ocean and thought this is the beginning of life. Um, and you'll read things that's filled with protein like it was jello. Um, and that's, that's not working anymore. Um, that's one of the things that we've discovered is that as we look in the cell, there's layer upon layer of functional things that just 
boggle the imagination and, and uh, I think that the term simple cell is now considered somewhat of an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. And in the future, when there is better understanding of this uh, 80%, uh, won't they feel the same way? Uh, I think that you will find uh, until evolution has lost its grip on, on education, you'll find two things being taught simultaneously. One, the cell is a marvelous example of organization, and two, it happened randomly so it can't be too complicated. Mm -hmm. And you'll have them both taught at the same time. I keep raising, uh, wondering, uh, we go to a, uh, some kind of meteorite or we go to uh, these comets and, and they keep saying we're going to, f we're looking for life and they had special instruments to look for organic molecules there and, and they hollered, hey, we found some carbon well, we, there's been, we've known there's carbon out there for, I mean, the chondrites, uh, carbonaceous chondrites. Yeah. It's loaded with carbon. Right. Uh, and so on. Uh, and you sit and wonder, uh, what is the gap here between the, this thinking that uh, uh, if we can, life can arise so simply, it might have possibly arisen on uh, some of these uh, satellites of of uh, some of our planets and so on, uh, and all this data that we have here, I, uh, this incongruity uh, is difficult for me to uh, to evaluate if we're dealing with intelligent beings. Uh, but it, it seems to prevail, and it keeps on permeating the the, the public media that hey, we're, we're looking for life here in the origin of life and the so on thing. Uh, do they realize really what life is like? Well, the thing you have to realize is that uh, the same kind of phenomena took place in economics, where there were people who were insisting that uh, uh, a Marxist uh, approach was uh, explained everything, and just the the insistence was there regardless of the evidence because it needed to be there for the theory to be correct. And once you, once you, um, you know, once you took a good look at the theory without its protective shell, so to speak, that simply said we know we're right and therefore the evidence must follow what we think it ought to, um, the theory falls apart. And I think that for pure evolutionary theory the same thing is true, but we're still in the, in the era before the fall of Eastern Europe. What I don't quite understand is how can a science er, scientist ever stick his neck out and come up with a with junk to actually look at something, can't understand something, and so conclude it's junk? I mean, isn't that kind of like God of the Gap in reverse? It is a God of the Gap in reverse, and it's an argument that evolution impedes scientific discovery because if you think it's junk you're not going to look at it. Whereas if you think it uh, has a purpose you want to find out what that purpose is. And it's very interesting because in, in fact biologists have usually, biologists who aren't dealing with evolutionary biology have usually presumed that if something is there and it's persistent that there must be some function for it. But it's almost like they needed to find junk. 
And so... Yes, it is almost like they needed to find junk. Now, you'll find a cautionary tale by, uh, that's written by Tim Standish in Origins, but you will find a reaction to the ENCODE group, and I've forgotten what the guy's name is, but I'll have it in a week or two, um, who has written apparently several papers with the specific intent of answering the ENCODE data and saying that it really isn't that good, and therefore the proportion of junk is more like 90% than 20% or less. And uh, we'll get to see the evidence that they use. And we'll get to see whether it's any good. And, whether, uh, and what the evidence for the ENCODE people are. And uh, then I guess you can make up your own mind. Um, I can tell you which way I rather suspect the evidence will come out. But, you know, one of, the, one of the jobs of anybody who's doing this is to not put their finger on, on the scale. Uh, by the way, it is about 11.30, so I know some of you have a, other places to go. Um, but for those of you who want to stay, we'll finish a little more of the conversation. Now, you do record these. And these are put on to YouTube, right? Are you getting any kind of feedback or responses uh, from people who see it maybe on the first time uh, on YouTube? Uh, yes, we do. Um, not as much as we might want to, although I think that one of the things we're doing is creating a record for people who will come in the future as well. Um, and I do know that there are a number of people who are kind of watching these every week uh, because they're interested in what we have to say. And, uh, and I know that because they're starting to advertise the, you know, go see this video. And they'll say, about the 30-minute mark, he says so-and-so. And it's -so, uh, very interesting. You know, obviously they've gone through at least 30 minutes of the, of the video. So yeah, it does. Um, it, it's out there and it's making some some impact. It's not uh, not earth shaking at this point, um, but it's it's making some, and and it may make more as time goes on because the issues may come to the fore more than they are now. I I'm just wondering. I'm just reacting to uh, the presentations just for myself. Uh, I am wondering if you made maybe a few more comments uh, and explanations about what, you know, is said there. Mm, instead uh, of just going straight through. Mm -hmm. To where it, where uh, more people maybe can mm. really see what this is saying. I'm, I, I don't think that I'm the only one who really, uh, you lose me. Uh, just so oftentimes I'm going back to rethink, you know, just what it has said and uh, the thought has moved on and, and uh, I feel a little lost. Well, uh, there's always a balance between that and, and, and people who are really experienced at the area, uh, you know, having you know, oh boy, not this again kind of thing. Um, but uh, uh, you may have noticed that there are several areas that as I was reading, I stopped and yeah. went around something. Pardon me? Not enough. Not enough. Uh, that's, a, that's a fair comment, and I'll take it in an advisement as a, we go on. Because we do want to stretch our thinking and to be able to grasp some of these things that are just, you know, really are, are even presently on the edge of science. Yeah. So, and and uh, dealing with that 80 percent, this is beyond science. Or de dealing with the 20 percent, you mean? The the 80 percent, the junk. Yeah. You know, term so term. That's true. We're we're running into areas that that uh, are not as well established as some areas in science. 
And sometimes people will take advantage of that and say, it's my way, uh, when they really don't know. Um, maybe what we should do is uh, slow it down just a little bit. Uh, this is kind of offered as a, <coughs> a footnote again to what has already been said. Um, I found the Crick's statement curious. Um, what is it? DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us. Now this, pro this pronoun, us, is obviously problematic and requires some definition. Um, just let me explain. When I f I've been coming to this church now for maybe five weeks, so I'm kind of a newbie here. And when I came here, I thought I was in heaven because I have not been in a church that had a pipe organ or musicians of this kind of skill, like I say, for 40 years. It's utterly amazing to me that, you know, I had almost forgotten what it was like. So now, um, <coughs> taking music itself, music is one way that a human being interprets or works out the meaning of what it means to be human. All right. We know that biologically we're born either male or female, to give another example. But what, when we use the terms masculine and feminine, whole institutions are built around those. By using those terms, we are working out what it means to us to be human, what it means to be, you know, belong to this mode of being, which is human being. All right, now, again, music, the proper question should be for anybody, given the reality, this institutional reality, which is music, what needs to be presupposed in order that that's true? Because nobody can deny it. I mean, we have to start where we are. But the naturalist seems to be saying, well, given that both that's true and his naturalist hypothesis tr is true, there must be some process in between, some mysterious process that creates the nexus. And he's saying to us, if you guys can't figure that out, and it bothers you so much, well, that's your problem. And uh, <laughs> that, that to me is incredible dogmatism. It's like saying, well, you know, what makes a clock work? Well, it has this characteristic of clockness. And if you don't know what clockness means, well, you know, that's your problem. Well, that explains absolutely nothing. That's just a word that one uses to cover up one's ignorance. And so far, a quantum leap has been made between biology and the ontology of, of, of human being. And how do you fill this in? It's just a quantum leap, which has got to be an act of faith. Nothing more, nothing less. But that's not science, is it? Uh, no, it's not. And, and that's, that's one of the kind of important things that um, even if you were to subscribe to DNA makes uh, RNA makes, makes protein, but perhaps a few additions of RNA can make DNA, and uh, um, you know, DNA can make more DNA, and RNA can occasionally make uh, more RNA. Even if you subscribe to that kind of thing, um, it makes protein makes us is a huge leap. Um, and I'm not sure that you can say that, uh, for example, Mozart was determined by his DNA. Uh, I'm sure that his father had something to do with it. You know, um, I, I mean, not, <coughs> not his father in the sense of, of his father just simply making him, but his father also training him in what was uh, the uh, uh, music of the day. And he obviously picked it up at a very young age, and you can do that, uh, or at least some people can do that. Um, but, but the whole idea of culture and the, the idea that there's something beyond what the human organism as a physical organism um, does, I think it's, it gets into the whole question of, uh, you know, are ideas real? And can they be reduced to physical mechanism? Worse than that, are our understandings of ideas, ideals real, and can they be reduced to physical mechanism? And you'll notice that 
reducing them to physical mechanisms seems to make them unreal in a certain sense, or at least not uh, makes our perception of them untrustworthy. If uh, the reason why you think some thought is because you, you know, pizza didn't agree with you last night, most people would say there's that the conclusion that you reached is not a, a valid one. But if everything is a result of a combination of the pizza you ate last night plus your genes plus your experiences as a little kid plus your most recent experiences and you add all them up and and that's all that you have then it would then it would imply that that the thoughts that you're thinking are not accurate and of course that applies to people who uh, believe that your thoughts are the result of all of those as well which means their thoughts are not accurate or not trustworthy and this actually goes back to Darwin who said who would trust the the thoughts of a monkey's mind uh, if there are any thoughts and if we were just a glorified monkey then who would trust our thoughts so it kind of it kind of points to you if you believe in the kind of reductive materialism that is popular, basically it saws off the, the limb that it's sitting on. You know, and on this very point, Judaism, Christianity are revealed religions. Yeah, we are, we are, de <laughs> what, what do we trust? in this world? Do we trust our own mind more than somebody else's mind? Uh, and what is beyond that? It's, it's revelation. And uh, Jesus being the revelation of God, you know, God becoming flesh, uh, that's the ultimate. Be, and, and he has to be tested by all the law and the prophets, uh, Old and New Testament. And so uh, we come down to the, the very basis of uh, what is faith. That is true. One of the things that I wanted to point out is that the science of genetics as it is being practiced and as we are getting more information about it is at least friendly to the idea that there's something out there beyond us uh, that designed us mm -hmm. and right. that uh, if we believe that we live a somewhat decent somewhat um, uh, pleasant life that it raises the question if perhaps if we knew who created us more we might be able to live a more pleasant life and kind of pushes us in the direction of looking for what whatever this uh, creator may have said and I, I think once you get to there materialism is pretty much dead Well, I'll invite you all to come next week uh, when we will discuss multiple codes in DNA. And we'll try to slow it down a little bit and explain it a little bit more so that... <laughs> so that it will be easier for bright but otherwise uninformed people to follow. One thing, when I send out the email... I usually include references, so if you read those ahead of time, it may be helpful.